Evod the warlock dwelling beside the boreal sea was aware of many strange and untimely portents in midsummer. Frorley burned the sun above Mu Tulan from a welkin clear and wanish as ice. At eve the aurora was hung from zenith to earth like an arras in a high chamber of gods. Wan and rare were the poppies and small the anemones in the cliff-sequestered vales lying behind the house of Eva, and the fruits in his walled garden were pale of rind and green at the core. Also he beheld by day the unseasonable flight of great multitudes of fowl, going southward from the hidden isles beyond Mu Thulan, and by night he heard the distressful clamor of other passing multitudes. And always in the loud wind and crying surf he hearkened to the weird whisper of voices from realms of perennial winter. Now Eva was troubled by these portents even as the rude fisherfolk on the shore of the haven below his house were troubled. Being a past master of all sortilage and a seer of remote and future things, he made use of his arts in an effort to divine their meaning. But a cloud was upon his eyes through the daytime, and a darkness thwarted him when he sought illumination in dreams. His most cunning horoscopes were put to naught. His familiars were silent or answered him equivocally, and confusion was amid all his geomancies and hydromancies and haruspications. And it seemed to Eve that an unknown power worked against him, mocking and making impotent in such fashion the sorcery that none had defeated heretofore. And Eve knew by certain tokens perceptible to wizards that the power was an evil power, and its boding was of bale to man. Day by day through the middle summer the fisher folk went forth in their coracles of elk hide and willow, casting their seines, but in the seines they drew dead fishes blasted as if by fire or extreme cold, and they drew living monsters such as their eldest captains had never beheld, things triple-headed and tailed and finned with horror, black shapeless things that turned to a liquid foulness and ran away from the net, or headless things like bloated moons with green frozen rays about them or things leprous-eyed and bearded with stiffly oozing slime. Then out of the sea horizon north, where ships from Cerngoth were wont to ply among the Arctic islands, a galley came drifting with idle oars and aimlessly veering helm. The tide beached it among the boats of the fishermen, which fared no longer to sea but were drawn up on the sands below the cliff-built house of Eva. And thronging about the galley in awe and wonder, the fishers beheld its oarsmen still at the oars and its captain at the helm. But the faces and hands of all were stark as bone, and were white as the flesh of leprosy, and the pupils of their open eyes had faded strangely, being indistinguishable now from the whites. And a blankness of horror was within them, like ice in deep pools that are fast frozen to the bottom. And Eva himself descending later also beheld the galley's crew and pondered much concerning the import of this prodigy. Loath were the fishers to touch the dead men, and they murmured, saying that a doom was upon the sea, and a curse upon all seafaring things and people. But Eva, deeming that the bodies would rot in the sun and would breed pestilence, commanded them to build a pile of driftwood about the galley. And when the pile had risen above the bulwarks, hiding from view the dead rowers, he fired it with his own hands. High flamed the pile, and smoke ascended black as a storm cloud, and was borne in windy volumes past the tall towers of Evog on the cliff. But later, when the fire sank, the bodies of the oarsmen were seen sitting amid the mounded embers, and their arms were still outstretched in the attitude of rowing, and their fingers were clenched, though the oars had now dropped away from them in brands and ashes. And the captain of the galley stood upright still in his place though the burnt helm had fallen beside him. Naught but the raiment of the marble corpses had been consumed, and they shone white as moon-washed marble above the charrings of wood, and nowhere upon them was there any blackness from the fire. Deeming this thing an ill miracle, the fishers were all aghast, and they fled swiftly to the uppermost rocks. There remained with Eva only his two servants, the boy Ratha and the ancient crone Ahilides, who had both witnessed many of his conjurations and were thus well inured to sights of magic. And with these two beside him the sorcerer awaited the cooling of the brands. Quickly the brands darkened, but smoke arose from them still throughout the noon and afternoon, and still they were over hot for human treading when the hour drew toward sunset. So Eva bade his servants to fetch water and urns from the sea and cast it upon the ashes and charrings. And after the smoke and the hissing had died, he went forward and approached the pale corpses. 
Nearing them he was aware of a great coldness, such as would emanate from transarctic ice, and the coldness began to ache in his hands and ears and smote sharply through the mantle of fur. Going still closer he touched one of the bodies with his forefinger tip, and the finger though lightly pressed and quickly withdrawn was seared as if by flame. Ivag was much amazed, for the condition of the corpses was a thing unknown to him heretofore, and in all his science of wizardry there was naught to enlighten him. He bethought him that a spell had been laid upon the dead, an ensorceling such as the wan polar demons might weave, or the chill witches of the moon might devise in their caverns of snow, and he deemed it well to retire for the time lest the spell should now take effect upon others than the dead. Returning to his house ere night, he burned at each door and window the gums that are most offensive to the northern demons, and at each angle where a spirit might enter he posted one of his own familiars to guard against all intrusion. Afterwards, while Ratha and Ahilidus slept, he perused with sedulous care the writings of Pinnam, in which are collated many powerful exorcisms. But ever and anon, as he read again for his comfort the old rubrics, he remembered ominously the saying of the prophet Lith, which no man had understood. There is one that inhabits the place of utter cold, and one that respireth where none other may draw breath. In the days to come he shall issue forth among the isles and cities of men, and shall bring with him as a white doom the wind that slumbereth in his dwelling. Though a fire burned in the chamber, piled with fat pine and terebinth, it seemed that a deadly chill began to invade the air toward midnight. Then, as Evok turned uneasily from the parchments of Panam, and saw that the fires blazed high as if in no need of replenishment, he heard the sudden turmoil of a great wind full of seabirds eerily shrieking, and the cries of landfowl driven on helpless wings, and over all a high laughter of diabolic voices. Madly from the north the wind beat upon his square-based towers, and birds were cast like blown leaves of autumn against the stout-paned windows, and devils seemed to tear and strain at the granite walls. Though the room's door was shut and the windows were tight-closed, an icy gust went round and round, circling the table where Avog sat, snatching the broad parchments of Nam from beneath his fingers and plucking at the lamp flame. Vainly, with numbing thoughts, he strove to recall that counter-charm which is most effective against the spirits of the boreal quarter. Then, strangely, it seemed that the wind fell, leaving a mighty stillness about the house. The chill gust was gone from the room, the lamp and the fire burned steadily, and something of warmth returned slowly into the half-frozen marrow of Eva. Soon he was made aware of a light shining beyond his chamber windows, as if a belated moon had now risen above the rocks. But Eva knew that the moon was at that time a thin crescent declining with eventide. It seemed that the light shone from the north, pale and frigid as fire of ice, and going to the window he beheld a great beam that traversed all the sea, coming as if from the hidden pole. In that light the rocks were paler than marble, and the sands were whiter than sea salt, and the huts of the fishermen were as white tombs. The walled garden of Eva was full of the beam, and all the green had departed from its foliage, and its blossoms were like flowers of snow. And the beam fell bleakly on the lower walls of his house, but left still in shadow the wall of that upper chamber from which he looked. He thought that the beam poured from a pale cloud that had mounted above the sea line, or else from a white peak that had lifted skyward in the night, but of this he was uncertain. Watching, he saw that it rose higher in the heavens, but climbed not upon his walls. Pondering in vain the significance of the mystery, he seemed to hear in the air about him a sweet and wizard voice, and speaking in a tongue that he knew not, the voice uttered a rune of slumber. And Eva could not resist the rune and upon him fell such a numbness of sleep as overcomes the outworn watcher in a place of snow. Walking stiffly at dawn, he rose up from the floor where he had lain and witnessed a strange marvel, for lo, in the harbor there towered an iceberg such as no vessel had yet sighted in all its seafaring to the north, and no legend had told of among the dim Hyperborean Isles. It filled the broad haven from shore to shore and sheared up to a height immeasurable with piled escarpments and tiered precipices, and its pinnacles hung like towers in the zenith above the house of Eva. It was higher than the dread mountain Akoravomas, which belches rivers of flame and liquid stone that pour unquenched through Tsko Volpanomi to the Austral Main. 
It was steeper than the mountain Yarek, which marks the site of the boreal pole, and from it there fell a wand glittering on sea and land. Deathly and terrible was the glittering, and Eva knew that this was the light he had beheld in the darkness. Scarce could he draw breath in the cold that was on the air, and the light of the huge iceberg seared his eyeballs with an exceeding froreness. Yet he perceived an odd thing, that the rays of the glittering fell indirectly into either side of his house, and the lower chambers where Ratha and Ahalidas slept were no longer touched by the beam as in the night, and upon all his house there was naught but the early sun and the morning shadows. On the shore below he saw the charrings of the beached galley, and amid them the white corpses incombustible by fire, and along the sands and rocks the fisherfolk were lying or standing upright in still rigid postures, as if they had come forth from their hiding places to behold the pale beam and had been smitten by a magic sleep. And the whole harbor shore and the garden of Eva, even to the front threshold of his house, was like a place where frost has fallen thickly over all. Again he remembered the saying of Lith, and with much foreboding he descended to the ground story. There at the northern windows the boy Ratha and the hag Ahilidus were leaning with faces turned to the light. Stiffly they stood with wide open eyes, and a pale terror was in their regard, and upon them was the white death of the galley's crew. And nearing them the sorcerer was stayed by the terrible chillness that smote upon him from their bodies. He would have fled from the house, knowing his magic wholly ineffectual against this thing. But it came to him that death was in the direct falling of the rays from the iceberg, and leaving the house he must perforce enter that fatal light. And it came to him also that he alone of all who dwelt on that shore had been exempted from the death. He could not surmise the reason of his exemption, but in the end he deemed it best to remain patiently and without fear, waiting whatever should befall. Returning to his chamber he busied himself with various conjurations, but his familiars had gone away in the night forsaking the angles at which he had posted them, and no spirit either human or demoniacal made reply to his questions, and not in any way known to wizards could he learn aught of the iceberg or divine the least inkling of its secret. Presently as he labored with his useless cantrips he felt on his face the breathing of a wind that was not air but a subtler and rarer element cold as the moon's ether. His own breath forsook him with agonies unspeakable and he fell down on the floor in a sort of swoon that was near to death. In the swoon he was doubtfully aware of voices uttering unfamiliar spells. Invisible fingers touched him with icy pangs and about him came and went a bleak radiance like a tide that flows and ebbs and flows again. Intolerable was the radiance to all his senses, but it brightened slowly with briefer ebbings, and in time his eyes and his flesh were tempered to endure it. Full upon him now was the light of the iceberg through his northern windows, and it seemed that a great eye regarded him in the light. He would have risen to confront the eye, but his swoon held him like a palsy. After that he slept again for a period. Waking he found in all his limbs their wanted strength and quickness. The strange light was still upon him, filling all his chamber, and peering out he witnessed a new marvel. For lo, his garden and the rocks and sea sands below it were visible no longer. In their stead were level spaces of ice about his house, and tall ice pinnacles that rose like towers from the broad battlements of a fortress. Beyond the verges of the ice he beheld a sea that lay remotely and far beneath, and beyond the sea the low looming of a dim shore. Terror came to Ivag now, for he recognized in all this the workings of a sorcery plenipotent, and beyond the power of all mortal wizards. For plain it was that his high house of granite stood no longer on the coast of Mutulan, but was based now on some upper crag of the iceberg. Trembling he knelt then and prayed to the old ones who dwell secretly in subterranean caverns, or abide under the sea or in the supermundane spaces. And even as he prayed, he heard a loud knocking at the door of his house. In much fear and wonder, he descended and flung wide the portals. Before him were two men, or creatures who had the likeness of men. Both were strange of visage and bright-skinned, and they wore for mantles such rune-woven stuffs as wizards wear. The runes were uncouth and alien, but when the man bespoke him, he understood something of their speech, which was in a dialect of the Hyperborean Isles. We serve the one whose coming was foretold by the prophet Lith, they said. From spaces beyond the limits of the north he hath come in his floating citadel, the ice mountain Yikilth, 
to voyage the mundane oceans and to blast with the chill spender the puny peoples of humankind. He hath spared us alone amid the inhabitants of the broad isle Thulask, and hath taken us to go with him in his seafaring upon Yikilth. He hath tempered our flesh to the rigor of his abode, and hath made respirable for us the air in which no mortal man may draw breath. Thee also he hath spared and hath acclimated by his spells to the coldness and the thin ether that go everywhere with Yikilth. Hail, O Eva, whom we know for a great wizard by this token, since only the mightiest of warlocks are thus chosen and exempted. Sorely astonished was Eva, but seeing that he had now to deal with men who were as himself, he questioned closely the two magicians of Thulask. They were named Duni and Ux Loden, and were wise in the lore of the elder gods. The name of the one that they served was Rulim Shakorth, and he dwelt in the highest summit of the ice mountain. They told Eva nothing of the nature or properties of Rulim Shakorth, and concerning their own service to this being, they avowed only that it consisted of such worship as is given to a god, together with the repudiation of all bonds that had linked them heretofore to mankind. And they told Eva that he was to go with them before Rulim Shakorth, and perform the due rite of obeisance, and accept the bond of final alienage. So Evog went with Duni and Uxlodin and was led by them to a great pinnacle of ice that rose unmeltable into the wan sun, beetling above all its fellows on the flat top of the berg. The pinnacle was hollow, and climbing therein by stairs of ice they came at last to the chamber of Relim Shakorth, which was a circular dome with a round block at the center forming a dais. And on the dais was that being whose advent prophet Lith had foretold obscurely. At sight of this entity the pulses of Eva were stilled for an instant by terror, and following quickly upon the terror his gorge rose within him through excess of loathing. In all the world there was naught that could be likened for its foulness to Relim Shakorth, something he had of the semblance of a fat white worm, but his bulk was beyond that of the sea elephant. His half-coiled tail was thick as the middle folds of his body and his front reared upward from the dais in the form of a white round disc, and upon it were imprinted vaguely the lineaments of a visage belonging neither to beast of the earth nor ocean creature. And amid the visage a mouth curved uncleanly from side to side of the disc, opening and shutting incessantly on a pale and tongueless and toothless maw. The eye sockets of Rulim Shakorth were close together between his shallow nostrils, and the sockets were eyeless, but in them appeared from moment to moment globules of a blood-colored matter having the form of eyeballs. And ever the globules broke and dripped down before the dais, and from the ice floor of the dome there ascended two masses like stalagmites, purple and dark as frozen gore, which had been made by the ceaseless dripping of the globules. Duni and Ux Loden prostrated themselves before the being, and Eva deemed it well to follow their example. Lying prone on the ice, he heard the red drops falling with a splash as of heavy tears, and then in the dome above him it seemed that a voice spoke, and the voice was like the sound of some hidden cataract in a glacier hollow with caverns. Behold, O Eva, said the voice, I have preserved thee from the doom of thy fellow men, and have made thee as they that inhabit the bourne of coldness, and they that inhale the airless void. Wisdom ineffable shall be thine, and mastery beyond the conquest of mortals, if thou wilt but worship me and become my thrall. With me thou shalt voyage amid the kingdoms of the north, and shalt pass among the green southern islands, and see the white falling of death upon them in the light from Yekilth. Our coming shall bring eternal frost on their gardens, and shall set upon their people's flesh the seal of that gulf whose rigor paleth one by one the most ardent stars, and putteth rhyme at the core of suns. All this thou shalt witness, being as one of the lords of death, supernal and immortal, and in the end thou shalt return with me to that world beyond the uttermost pole, in which is mine abiding empire. For I am he whose coming even the gods may not oppose. Now seeing that he was without choice in the matter, Eva professed himself willing to yield worship and service to the pale worm. Beneath the instruction of Duni and Uxlodin, he performed the sevenfold rite that is scarce suitable for narration here, and swore the threefold vow of unspeakable alienation. Thereafter, for many days and nights, he sailed with Rulim Shaikorth adown the coast of Mu Tulan. Strange was the manner of that voyaging, for it seemed that the great iceberg was guided by the sorcery of the worm, prevailing ever against wind and tide, 
and always by night or day like the beams of a deathly beacon, the chill splendor smote afar from Yikilth. Proud galleys were overtaken as they fled southward, and their crews were blasted at the oars, and often ships were caught and embedded in the new bastions of ice that formed daily around the base of that ever-growing mountain. The fair Hyperborean ports, busy with maritime traffic, were stilled by the passing of Rulim Shaykorth. Idle were their streets and wharves, idle was the shipping in their harbors, when the pale light had come and gone. Far inland fell the rays, bringing to the fields and gardens a blight of transarctic winter and forests were frozen, and the beasts that roamed them were turned as if into marble, so that men who came long afterward to that region found the elk and bear and mammoth still standing in all the postures of life. But dwelling upon Yakilth, the sorcerer Eva was immune to the icy death, and sitting in his house or walking abroad on the berg he was aware of no sharper cold than that which abides in summer shadows. Now, beside Duni and Uxlauden, the sorcerers of Thulask, there were five other wizards that went with Evog on that voyage, having been chosen by Rulim Shaykorth. They too had been tempered to the coldness by Yikilth, and their houses had been transported to the Burg by unknown enchantment. They were outlandish and uncouth men called Polarians, from islands nearer the pole than broad Thulask, and Eva could understand little of their ways and their sorcery was foreign to him, and their speech was unintelligible. Nor was it known to the Thulaskians. Daily the eight wizards found on their tables all the provender necessary for human sustenance, though they knew not the agency by which it was supplied. All were united in the worship of the white worm, and all, it seemed, were content in a measure with their lot, and were fain of that unearthly lore and dominion which the worm had promised them. But Evag was uneasy at heart and rebelled in secret against his thraldom to Rilim Shakorth, and he beheld with revulsion the doom that went forth eternally from Yikilth upon lovely cities and fruitful ocean shores. Ruthfully he saw the blasting of flower-girdled Cerngoth and the boreal stillness that descended on the thronged streets of Lequan, and the frost that seared with sudden whiteness the garths and orchards of the sea-fronting valley of Aguil. And sorrow was in his heart for the fishing coracles and the byrams of trade and warfare that floated manless after they had met Yikilth. Ever southward sailed the great iceberg, bearing its lethal winter to lands where the summer sun rode high. And Eva kept his own counsel and followed in all ways the custom of Duni and Ux Laden and the others. At intervals that were regulated by the motions of the circumpolar stars, the eight wizards climbed to that lofty chamber in which Relim Shaykorth abode perpetually, half-coiled on his dais of ice. There, in a ritual whose cadences corresponded to the falling of those eye-like tears that were wept by the worm, and with genuflections timed to the yawning and shutting of his mouth, they yielded to Relim Shaykorth the required adoration. Sometimes the worm was silent, and sometimes he bespoke them, renewing vaguely the promises he had made. And Ive learned from the others that the worm slept for a period at each darkening of the moon, and only at that time did the sanguine tears suspend their falling, and the mouth forbear its alternate closing and gaping. At the third repetition of the rites of worship, it came to pass that only seven wizards climbed to the tower. Eva, counting their number, perceived that the missing man was one of the five outlanders. Afterwards he questioned Duni and Uxlauden regarding this matter and made signs of inquiry to the four northrons, but it seemed that the fate of the absent warlock was a thing mysterious to them all. Nothing was seen or heard of him from that time, and Eva, pondering long and deeply, was somewhat disquieted. For during the ceremony in the tower chamber it had seemed to him that the worm was grosser of bulk and girth than on any prior occasion. Covertly he asked what manner of nutriment was required by Relim Shaykorth. Concerning this there was much dubiety and dispute, for Uxlauden maintained that the worm fed on nothing less unique than the hearts of white arctic bears, while Duni swore that his rightful nourishment was the liver of whales. But to their knowledge the worm had not eaten during their sojourn upon Yikilth, and both averred that the intervals between his times of feeding were longer than those of any terrestrial creature being computable not in hours or days but in whole years. Still the iceberg followed its course ever vaster and more prodigious beneath the heightening sun, and again at the star-appointed time which was the forenoon of every third day, 
the sorcerers convened in the presence of Rulim Shaikorth. To the perturbation of all, their number was now but six, and the lost warlock was another of the outlanders, and the worm had greatened still more in size, and the increase was visible as a thickening of his whole body from head to tail. Deeming these circumstances an ill augury, the six made fearful supplication to the worm in their various tongues, and implored him to tell them the fate of their absent fellows. And the worm answered, and his speech was intelligible to Evog and Uxladen and Duni and the three Northrons, each thinking that he had been addressed in his native language. This matter is a mystery concerning which ye shall all receive enlightenment in turn. Know this, the two that have vanished are still present, and they and ye also shall share even as I have promised in the ultra-mundane lore and empery of Relim Shaikorth. Afterwards, when they had descended from the tower, Eva and the two Thulaskians debated the interpretation of this answer. Eva maintained that the import was sinister, for truly their missing companions were present only in the worm's belly. But the others argued that these men had undergone a more mystical translation, and were now elevated beyond human sight and hearing. Forthwith they began to make ready with prayer and austerity, in expectation of some sublime apotheosis, which would come to them in due turn. But Evi was still fearful, and he could not trust the equivocal pledges of the worm, and doubt remained with him. Seeking to assuage his doubt and peradventure to find some trace of the lost Polarians, he made search of the mighty Berg, on whose battlements his own house and the houses of the other warlocks were perched like the tiny huts of fishers on ocean cliffs. In this quest the others would not accompany him, fearing to incur the worm's displeasure. From verge to verge of Yakilth he roamed unhindered as if on some broad plateau with peaks and horns, and he climbed perilously on the upper scarps, and went down into deep crevasses and caverns where the sun failed, and there was no other light than the strange luster of that unearthly ice. Embedded here in the walls as if in the stone of nether strata, he saw dwellings such as men had never built, and vessels that might belong to other ages or worlds. But nowhere could he detect the presence of any living creature, and no spirit or shadow gave response to the necromatic evocations which he uttered oftentimes as he went along the chasms and chambers. So Evog was still apprehensive of the worm's treachery, and he resolved to remain awake on the night preceding the next celebration of the rites of worship. And at eve of that night, he assured himself that the other wizards were all housed in their separate mansions to the number of five. And having ascertained this, he set himself to watch without remission the entrance of Relim Shaikorth's tower, which was plainly visible from his own windows. Weird and chill was the shining of the berg in the darkness, for a light as of frozen stars was effulgent at all times from the ice. A moon that was little past the full arose early on the Orient Seas, but Eva, holding vigil at his window till midnight, saw that no visible form emerged from the tall tower and none entered it. At midnight there came upon him a sudden drowsiness, such as would be felt by one who had drunk some opiate wine, and he could not sustain his vigil any longer but slept deeply and unbrokenly throughout the remainder of the night. On the following day there were but four sorcerers who gathered in the ice dome and gave homage to Relim Shekorth. And Evok saw that two more of the outlanders, men of bulk and stature dwarfish beyond their fellows, were now missing. One by one thereafter, on nights preceding the ceremony of worship, the companions of Eva vanished. The last Polarian was next to go, and it came to pass that only Eva and Ux Laden and Duni went to the tower, and then Eva and Ux Laden went alone, and terror mounted daily in Eva, for he felt that his own time drew near and he would have hurled himself into the sea from the high ramparts of Yikilth, if Ux Laden, who perceived his intention, had not warned him that no man could depart therefrom and live again in solar warmth and terrene air, having been habituated to the coldness and thin ether. And Ux Laden, it seemed, was wholly oblivious to his doom, and was fain to impute an esoteric significance to the ever-growing bulk of the white worm and the vanishing of the wizards. So at that time, when the moon had waned and darkened wholly, it occurred that Eva climbed before Relim Shekorth with infinite trepidation and loath laggard steps. And entering the dome with downcast eyes, he found himself to be the sole worshipper. 
A palsy of fear was upon him as he made obeisance, and scarcely he dared to lift his eyes and regard the worm. But even as he began to perform the customary genuflections, he became aware that the red tears of Relim Shakorth no longer fell on the purple stalagmites, nor was there any sound such as the worm was wont to make by the perpetual opening and shutting of his mouth. And venturing at last to look upward, Eva beheld the abhorrently swollen mass of the monster, whose thickness was such as to overhang the dais's rim, and he saw that the mouth and eye holes of Rulim Shakorth were closed as if in slumber. And thereupon he recalled how the wizards of Thulask had told him that the worm slept for an interval at the darkening of each moon, which was a thing he had forgotten temporarily in his extreme dread and apprehension. Now was Eva sorely bewildered, for the rites he had learned from his fellows could be fittingly performed only while the tears of Rulim Shakorth fell down, and his mouth gaped and closed and gaped again in measured alternation. And none had instructed him as to what rites were proper and suitable during the slumber of the worm. And being in much doubt, he said softly, Wakest thou, O Relim Shakorth? In reply, he seemed to hear a multitude of voices that issued obscurely from out the pale, tumid mass before him. The sound of the voices was weirdly muffled, but among them he distinguished the accents of Dooney and Uxlauden, and there was a thick muttering of outlandish words which Eva knew for the speech of the five Polarians, and beneath this he caught, or seemed to catch, innumerable undertones that were not the voices of men or beasts, nor such sounds as would be emitted by earthly demons, and the voices rose and clamored like those of a throng of prisoners in some profound oubliette. Anon, as he listened in horror ineffable, the voice of Dooney became articulate above the others, and the manifold clamor and muttering ceased, as if a multitude were hushed to hear its own spokesman. And Eva heard the tones of Dooney saying, The worm sleepeth, but we whom the worm hath devoured are awake. Direly has he deceived us, for he came to our houses in the night, devouring us bodily one by one as we slept under the enchantment he had wrought. He has eaten our souls even as our bodies, and verily we are part of Relim Shakorth, but exist only as in a dark and noisome dungeon. And while the worm wakes, we have no separate or conscious being, but are merged wholly in the ultra-terrestrial being of Relim Shakorth. Hear then, O Evag, the truth we have learned from our oneness with the worm. He has saved us from the white doom and has taken us upon Yikilth for this reason because we alone of all mankind who are sorcerers of high attainment and mastery may endure the lethal ice change and become breathers of the airless void and thus in the end be made suitable for the provender of such as Relim Shaikorth. Great and terrible is the worm, and the place wherefrom he cometh and whereto he returneth is not to be dreamt of by living men. And the worm is omniscient, save that he knows not the waking of them he has devoured, and their awareness during his slumber. But the worm, though ancient beyond the antiquity of worlds, is not immortal and is vulnerable in one particular. Whosoever learneth the time and means of his vulnerability and hath heart for this undertaking may slay him easily, and the time for the deed is during his term of sleep. Therefore we adjure thee now by the faith of the old ones to draw the sword thou wearest beneath thy mantle and plunge it in the side of Relim Shakorth for such is the means of his slaying. Thus alone, O Eva, shall the going forth of the pale death be ended, and only thus shall we, thy fellow sorcerers, obtain release from our blind thraldom and incarceration, and with us many that the worm hath betrayed and eaten in former ages and upon distant worlds. And only by the doing of this thing shalt thou escape the wan and loathly mouth of the worm, nor abide henceforward as a doubtful ghost among other ghosts in the evil blackness of his belly. But know, however, that he who slayeth Relim Shakorth must necessarily perish in the slaying. Evog, being wholly astounded, made question of Duni and was answered readily concerning all that he asked. And oftentimes the voice of Ux Loden replied to him. And sometimes there were unintelligible murmurs as outcries from certain others of those foully and mewed phantoms. Much did Eva learn of the worm's origin and essence, and he was told the secret of Yikilth, and the manner wherein Yikilth had floated down from transarctic gulfs to voyage the seas of earth. Ever as he listened, his abhorrence greatened, though deeds of dark sorcery and conjured devils had long indurated his flesh and soul, making him callous to more than common horrors. 
but of that which he learned it were ill to speak now. At length there was silence in the dome, for the worm slept soundly, and Eva had no longer any will to question the ghost of Duny, and they that were imprisoned with Duny seemed to wait and watch in a stillness of death. Then being a man of much hardihood and resolution, Eva delayed no more but drew from its ivory sheath the short but well-tempered sword of bronze which he carried always at his baldric. Approaching the dais closely, he plunged the blade in the overswelling mass of Relim Shakorth. The blade entered easily with a slicing and tearing motion, as if he had stabbed a monstrous bladder and was not stayed even by the broad pommel, and the whole right hand of Eva was drawn after it into the wound. He perceived no quiver or stirring of the worm, but out of the wound there gushed a sudden torrent of black liquescent matter, swiftening and deepening irresistibly till the sword was caught from Eva's grasp as if in a mill race. Hotter far than blood and smoking with strange steam-like vapors, the liquid poured over his arms and splashed his raiment as it fell. Quickly the ice was awash about his feet, but still the fluid welled as if from some inexhaustible spring of foulness, and it spread everywhere in pools and runlets that came together. Eva would have fled then, but the sable liquid mounting and flowing was above his ankles when he neared the stairhead, and it rushed adown the stairway before him like a cataract in some steeply pitching cavern. Hotter and hotter it grew, boiling, bubbling, while the current strengthened and clutched at him and drew him like malignant hands. He feared to essay the downward stairs, nor was there any place now in all the dome where he could climb for refuge. He turned, striving against the tide for bare foothold, and saw dimly through the reeking vapors the throned mass of Relim Shakorth. The gash had widened prodigiously, and a stream surged from it like the waters of a broken weir, billowing outward around the dais. And yet, as if in further proof of the worm's unearthly nature, his bulk was in no wise diminished thereby, and still the black liquid came in an evil flood, and it rose swirling about the knees of Eva, and the vapors seemed to take the forms of a myriad press of phantoms, wreathing obscurely together and dividing once more as they went past him. Then as he tottered and grew giddy on the stairhead, he was swept away and was hurled to his death on the ice steps far below. That day, on the sea to eastward of Middle Hyperborea, the crews of certain merchant galleys beheld an unheard of thing. For lo, as they sped north, returning from far ocean isles with a wind that aided their oars, they sighted in the late forenoon a monstrous iceberg whose pinnacles and crags loomed high as mountains. The berg shone in part with a weird light, and from its loftiest pinnacle poured an ink-black torrent, and all the ice cliffs and buttresses beneath were a stream with rapids and cascades and sheeted falls of the same blackness that fumed like boiling water as they plunged oceanward, and the sea around the iceberg was clouded and streaked for a wide interval, as if with the dark fluid of the cuttlefish. The mariners feared to sail closer, but full of awe and marveling, they stayed their oars and lay watching the berg, and the wind dropped so that their galleys drifted within view of it all that day. They saw that the berg dwindled swiftly, melting as though some unknown fire consumed it, and the air took on a strange warmth and the water about their ships grew tepid. Crag by crag the ice was runnelled and eaten away and huge portions fell off with a mighty splashing and the highest pinnacle collapsed. But still the blackness poured out as from an unfathomable fountain. The mariners thought at whiles that they beheld houses running seaward amid the loosened fragments. But of this they were uncertain because of those ever-mounting vapors. By sunset time the berg had diminished to a mass no larger than a common flow, yet still the welling blackness overstreamed it, and it sank low in the wave, and the weird light was quenched altogether. Thereafter, the night being moonless, it was lost to vision, and a gale rose blowing strongly from the south, and at dawn the sea was void of any remnant. Concerning the matters related above, many and various legends have gone forth throughout Mu Thulan and all the extreme hyperboreal kingdoms and archipelagos, even to the southmost isle of Ostror. The truth is not in such tales, for no man has known the truth heretofore. But I, the sorcerer Iban, calling up through my necromancy the wave-wandering specter of Ivag, have learned from him the veritable history of the worm's advent and I have written it down in my volume with such omissions as are needful for the sparing of mortal weakness and sanity.
And men will read this record together with much more of the Elder Lore in days long after the coming and melting of the Great Glacier.